we've met this fellow, Zantamak, falling, uh, whose fall to earth was recognized during the Festival of the Dead, which is the Halloween festival. And these are star glyphs. You see these things? These represent stars. And one of the early astronomically uh, educated Mayanists, Stansbury Hagar, interpreted these as being falling stars. And you'll notice when we go back to that vase, you see there, see here they are right here? Mm -hmm. Notice those are the same things. And then we have the alchemical symbol for fire up here. In fact, it turns out that this equilateral triangle appears to have been used all over the ancient world as a symbol for fire. It still survives, you know, in, in astrological symbolism. That's uh, that's unusual. It's a tatva also. It's what? A tatva. Oh, oh yeah, one of the tatvas or tatvas. So how do you account for the uh, the same correspondence? Well, again, we're looking at either universal archetypes or a diffused a diffusionist tradition that comes, you know, from some ultimate source. That. Okay, what else is on this figure here that we that I have not pointed out yet? Why is he falling? Yeah. Ah, well there, my friend, is the rub. So we'll get to that. What is this? An important in answer to your question, an important clue is this thing right here. Yes, it's the Pleiades. Right, thank you, Jerry. That's the Pleiades. Mayan symbol for the Pleiades. Yes. And why rattlesnake for Pleiades? Well, a number of reasons. For one thing, a rattlesnake can be extremely dangerous. However, rattlesnakes always give forewarning, don't they? Huh? Well, how did you connect that to the Pleiades, though? I'm sorry, I just don't, you know. What, this? Yeah. I didn't. The Mayans did. How did, how did you know they did? <laughs> Well, that's been pretty much... He wants proof. <laughs> oh, I mean, you can go to Mayanists from half a century or more ago who've been studying Mayan glyphs, and it's, that's, I mean, that is the symbol for the Pleiades right there. That's a given. Okay. It's a also, given. Now notice it. if, also, if you want, Dor Dolores, I can certainly put you onto the, you know, uh, Co, C-O-E, he was one of the, the big Mayanists who studied... Mayan hieroglyphs for, for decades. Um, I can give you a list of about three or four of them if you want to go to some sources. Yeah, in the same way that that first thing I showed you was the Venus symbol. Right, okay. All the Mayan glyphs have not been translated. Yeah, you said everything has significance. In this one, he's naked and it's anatomically correct. So mm -hmm. there's there's no stuff all over his body. So is is that some type of significance, whereas the other ones are, were adorned or they had some type of... Well, now here, here we see, now here Dolores is one way, this was, I, I have not put in the entire reconstruction of this zodiacal band at Akansa. This was a stucco relief that had uh, 24 figures that were all the whole signs of the zodiac in the correct distribution. And what we see here is the falling monkey, and this was their symbol for Taurus right here. So you have the Taurus and you have the Pleiades right here. See the rattlesnake? And the thing left? And this, yes, here's this bucket pouring out all of this... Aquarius crap? Aquarius crap, that's probably what that is, yes. And here we have the vase of the Falling Lord from the Southern Maya Lowlands, late classical period. I know it's hard to see, but and I've got a better. Here's that same builder's square thing here, mm -hmm. and you'll see here he is. He's falling. His legs are up, and you see the flames of fire shooting up around him. Right. Yeah. That's very important. And then up here above him in the sky, rather than just the glyph of the sky dragon, they have an actual dragon, cosmic serpent. Here's his mouth up here open with his eye and here's his body coiled around like this. 
I and here's his tail. You say it's a dragon, though? Well, a serpent dragon. They were cognate symbols, meaning, you know, particularly when you see him in the sky. We'll come back to the hanged man. Mm. He's pretty interesting. Here's Stansberry <laughs> Hagar, and we've read this already, so I'm not going to spend time on it, but the Mexicans told of certain stars called Zantamak, or falling hairs. And right there, that should be a trigger for you because yeah. we've learned that one of the symbolical connotations of comets is long hair, right? Mm. Along with swords, along with sickles, along with burning torches, the omega sign. Uh, <clears throat> so we've got falling hairs which fell from heaven to earth with the Lord of the Dead. In Egyptian mythology, who was the Lord of the Dead? Osiris. Osiris, yes. What happened to Osiris? Yeah, he was chopped up. <laughs> he was murdered and chopped up, and his pieces were scattered. Scattered into the Nile River. See, and then you realize that there's a cosmological counterpart to that. When to the Egyptians, the Nile River represented the Milky Way. And then when you realize that the Torrid, the progenitor of the Torrid system, would have been seen passing through the Milky Way as it was breaking up. Their fall was commemorated annually in the Holy Festival, said to have been held towards the end of October. This festival and the falling of the stars was associated with the end of the world. And see, we still, as, as you know, the prophets have said, the ancient knowledge is everywhere about us in everyday use and perfect. And little do we know that every year, you know, we, we, we mechanically carry out these various customs and ceremonies and habitual modes of behavior which have their roots so far back that they're prehistoric. So every year on October the October 31st, All Hallows Eve, the kids get dressed up and go out and play pr pranks and tricks and collect goodies and dress up like monsters and ghosts and all of this. And what are they doing? They're essentially performing a ritual that to ancient peoples actually had a real meaning because they, they knew the cosmological reality behind it. And now that cosmological reality has been lost or forgotten, but the outer form is still there with the idea that at some point we may consciously reconnect with these forms and ceremonies that are part of our everyday <clears throat> life without any, without any real thought. Yes, Jerry? Go back to Osiris for a second. Um, does the Jed Pillar figure in somewhere on this? Probably. Have you checked that? Somewhat. But that'll take us a little far afield. Well, I know it's a digression. I just wondered if there was The Mayans there. have a counterpart to the Jed figure. Very good. As you would, yeah. Okay. Here, this is going back, this is going back to, eight, uh, to 1931, Dolores. Here, and as early as 1931, they had recognized the rattle astrum being the Pleiades. So here's one source I've got quoted. Zabek, or Zabek, the rattle astrum is our Pleiades. And that's that was their, their sign. Just you know, just like our sign for Taurus is a bull, their sign for the Pleiades was the rattlesnake. And the idea that the rattlesnake would strike, I think, is significant. And also the fact that it gave forewarning before it would strike. It could be like a little coil as you look at the the stars, the asterism, you know, it could be coiled up with the head coming out. Yeah, sure. It, it kind of looks like that. Okay, another one, Spindon. He, he was one of the famous Mayanists, and I'm pretty sure in Spindon's work, he was probably one of the first that would have identified that glyph. And then Linda Shell, who recently passed away, she gives, has written several whole books on the identification of Mayan glyphs. And it's in there. So I think it's pretty much agreed by most scholars. Yeah, Michael D. Coe, that's what I was talking about. And here we're getting into this, um, the flare god. Uh, the effigy gods, there was three groups. The jester gods, the shield bearers, and the flare gods. And it was the flare gods that are most significant in terms of what we've been learning about in here. Um, and you can see what it's saying here. I'll let you read this on your own because I've got a little bit of a horse throat tonight. Are you 
done? Anybody still reading? The, the important part, um, yeah, part of this is redundant, but read here. This co he identified the forehead tube at different periods as a bone tube, a pipe, and finally a cigar, which is the most significant. <clears throat> the flame-like appendage rising from the tube as smoke. Shell agrees that the object probably represents a smoking tobacco cigar. This his theory has been reinforced by David Kelly on a glyphic basis. As a separate glyph, the tubular pipe occurs only once in this particular codice prefixed to the star glyph. I have suggested that the combination is to be read Bud's Eck, or Smoking Star, a known Yucatec term for comets. The inscription suggests that the pipe has been fixed onto the head of God K. And let's see what God K looks like. There's God K. And here is this flare. This is God K as the flare god, showing he's got this flare coming out of his forehead, he's got it coming out of his crown, and he's got also got it coming out of the back of his head. And this, this flare has been associated with the Mayan cigars and cigar smoking. And why they held cigar smoking to be sacred. So here is from a very interesting work called The Smoking Gods. Um, Talking about God K. Okay, so here we have the Mayanists recognizing that there is astronomical significance to this God K. And they thought he might represent a star. Forstman and Schellhaas contemporary associated God K with the date 13 Ock ok and considered him to be a weather god because his ornamental nose, according to the conventional mode of the Central American peoples, is intended to represent the blast of the <laughs> storm. Barthel, in, 19, in the 1952 article on the Venus cult, also regarded God K as one of the storm gods, uh, and also associated with the old rain serpent. So, I was going to show you a lot of these different vases and stuff show these gods smoking. All of these are, depict, are descriptions of these different vases, which I'm going to show you pictures of. Uh, the vase of, of the old god holding a flare. Um, the vase of the black warrior, the plate of the young god with a flare, all of those see a young deity holding a torch or a large smoking cigar in his left hand. Uh, the vase of the black warrior is an old favorite of the Mayanists. It is mentioned here because of one of the main characters pictured on it is carrying a smoking cigar in his hand. Uh, a beautiful carved ceramic that Michael D. Coe calls the vase in the Chocola style. Two mythological scenes also depicts a deity bearing a cigar or a torch. Um, deities holding large cigars or torches. So my point in all of this is the Mayans had dozens and dozens of depictions of these one falling gods with torches or just falling associated with star symbols. Also these smoking gods were always seen either with a, with a flare a fiery smoking flare coming out of their foreheads or holding and smoking a cigar. So the significance of all of this um, was quite simply here, right here. here. Here's the connection. Some highland and lowland Mayan peoples still describe meteors or comets as the cigar butts of the gods. Mm -hmm. And it may be well that the cigars smoked by the hero twins of the Popol Vuh are intended to be understood as meteors. Throughout the Mayan area, area, meteors are thought to be evil omens forecasting sickness, war, and death. Well, once you have that, that's sort of like the, Ros the key to the Rosetta Stone, I believe. Once you know that these falling gods and these smoking gods with smoking cigars are representing of cosmic deities or cosmic entities, I think we now have a very important clue for making sense out of the whole the whole Mayan, Mayan cosmolo cosmological system. Let's go on here. Uh, yeah, contemporary Mayan peoples say that meteors are connected with discarded celestial cigars and cigarettes, torches, and ancient arrowheads made of obsidian. 
A number of contemporary Mayan, Maya terms do not distinguish between comets and meteors. This may also have been true in earlier times. The colonial period term Shamal Zutan means cigar of the devil, is interpreted as a comet. But Jesus Galindo suggests that when these cigars are discarded, they are transformed into meteors, which of course is a very scientific understanding. You know that meteors, we know that meteor showers come from the disintegration or break, breaking up of comets. Also, comets are referred to here as arrow of the devil, uh, arrow star. So even in the, in the Western Hemisphere, we find many of the same symbolical connotations as we do in the Eastern Hemisphere with comet. In addition now, we've got this new hieroglyph, that of the cigar. Now here, I'm going to let you guys read this on your own because here's the, connect, the probable connection with Venus. So go ahead and read this. Connection right here. For the simple reason that when we see the comets approaching from the sun, it appears that they could be emanating from Venus. I mean, that could be the actual visual illusion the comets are this was certainly the case with Tunguska that was seen coming from the sun. But then you also have the rattlesnake uh, Pleiades and they can come from there too, can't they? Oh yeah. So But you know sometimes the sun is where the Pleiades is. So if the sun was in the constellation of Taurus and Venus is around the sun, Venus could be could show up as a morning star superimposed right upon the Pleiades. So they're all in alignment. So they would all be in alignment, yes. Um, How often does that happen? Well, it would probably happen once a year. In May. Well, I mean, is Venus is a morning star, is it always, is that once a year? Uh, well, the period of Venus is what? Uh, right. 200 and some days. Yeah. Um, yeah, see, I've never worked that out. That'd be a very interesting thing to research and work out. We will go on. Several unpublished studies have linked the image of God L smoking a cigar in the Temple of the Cross at Palenque with the passage of Halley's Comet in AD 684. Although God L is clearly a Venus God, his cigar could represent a comet. So think about that. If God L actually represents Venus and, and he's smoking the cigar, and then when he's through smoking the cigar, he throws the cigar or he flicks the ashes. That's another depiction. By flicking the ashes, creating the meteor shower which again now is associated with Venus because so many comets can be seen approaching from the sun. And there is one of the Mayan cigar smoking gods and you see his ashes strewing outwards into space. And notice he's also got the little characteristic forehead flare up there. Something that you're beginning to hopefully recognize now base of the god K and the serpent dragon. Is that little thing on the forehead kind of rep represent like the Uraeus coming out of the Egyptian pharaoh? Oh, that, that's very, snake. This is very possible. I hadn't even thought of that. I'm going to go past this one. This is very interesting, but I have a, a depiction of it that I think will show you clearer what's going on. Okay, now here we see the smoking star comet on the left. And on the right is the god K. I showed you this a month ago. Um, here's the association of the two. The smoking, this is the glyph for the smoking star comet. And here's god, god K, showing this obvious association or connection between god K and, <coughs> and the comet. And here we see a bowl of god K and god L. And you'll notice this thing here with the four petals and the, and the, the, the tail discharging from it. You see that thing there? Very stylized, but very suggestive of a, of a comet, isn't it? <clears throat> and here's the same the same monkeys. Here he is, the spider monkey, smoking the same in, on the acansa stucco relief 
It was this monkey that was seen falling in the vicinity of the Pleiades. And you probably can't see this too good, so I have done a version of this is what you're looking at. <clears throat> One of the cigar smoking deities. But notice all the flares. You've got it coming off of his cigar, but you've also got one coming out of his headpiece up here, and you've got one here. You've got something, a, a flame coming out down here. Yes, this is this. This is from the uh, doorway leading into the sanctuary of the Temple of the Cross. Um, what is the definition of God in the Mayas? Well, just like just like you know, when you have these, you have these multiple these pantheons of gods in ancient Greece. We have names for them, you know, Zeus and Minerva and Poseidon and you know Demeter and all of those. Mayanists don't know the names that the Mayans themselves gave necessarily in, in a lot of cases to the gods in their pantheon. So they just designate them by letters, God K and God L. Every time a certain god shows up who's got identifying, distinguishing characteristics, he might be God K. If it's a different god who shows up with a typical different set of characteristics, he might be God L. So the point is, <clears throat> When the, in the Greek uh, mythology, we, when we see the gods are this symbolic for the goodness. But here, when we see the gods are the symbol of the, mm. the fire and comet and destruction. Well, you know, in, I think in the pantheons you had, you know, in, in Greek you had Hades. You know, in, in um, the Norse tradition you had Loki who was an evil destructive god, a tr god of trickery. In the tr tr Christian tradition we have the devil, Diablo, or Lucifer, who basically fulfilled that same role. And I've shown you in a couple of examples how if you actually go into the original interpretation and etymologies of some of the passages describing the devil in the Bible, they're very strikingly consistent with a lot of other traditions in attributing to, I mean, remember what, what was unique to Lucifer or the devil? Wasn't he the fallen god, the fallen angel? Mm. Absolutely, see? And the so what, what we're seeing is star, what? The bright morning star. The, right, the bright morning star. I mean, what does that association have to do? <clears throat> but see, it's all mixed up. Once you get past a fundamentalist literal interpretation, you get in, right, at the very end of the book of Revelations, in words attributed to Jesus, he says, I am the bright morning star. I am the, the root and offspring of David. I am the bright mor and morning star. Well, why is he identifying himself with exactly the same attributions that were given to Lucifer? Right? That was the last <coughs> spoken words of Jesus as quoted in the Bible. Okay, so explain that then? No, I'm not, no you have to think about it. <laughs> Well, <laughs> see, that, that, that same idea is actually reflected on other levels. When you go into the Kabbalah, which is, trans, which is a whole weird system of translating the Bible symbolically, okay? In, in the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, remember you had the story about the serpent in the garden beguiling Eve and telling Eve that... Oh, did, did Yahweh tell you to not eat of the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge? And she says, yay. He says, if I eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, I will surely die. And the serpent says to her, you shall not surely die. If you eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as the gods. That's what he says to her. And then it says, so she looked at the fruit and saw that it was pleasant to the eyes and a fruit to be desired to make one wise, so she reached out and took the fruit and ate of the fruit. And she gave unto her husband to eat. And what in fact then happened to him when they ate of the fruit? They became Well, in the words of the, the Bible itself, the eyes of them both were opened, just as who said would happen. Right? Now if you look at this tale of the serpent in the garden, he is Nachash. Nun Het Sheen. 
Nun Het Sheen was the name of the serpent. Nun, 50. Het, 8. Sheen, 300. What's 300 plus 50 plus 8? 358. 358. Okay, now we have prophecies about Meshiach. Who was Meshiach? Messiah. And how do you spell Messiah? Mem, let me see. Mem, Sheen, Yod, Het. Mem is 40. Sheen is 300. Yod is 10. Het is 8. So 358. Now is this a coincidence that the Messiah and the serpent have the same number? No, it's not a it's, no, it's not at all. And if it was an isolated case, you might be able to dismiss it as coincidence. But it is it is far from an isolated case, showing that there's a deeper meaning behind the dichotomies presented in the scripture. So what's 358? What's 358? Well, for one thing, it's the first three terms of the Fibonacci sequence, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, etc., which is the logarithmic spiral, perhaps the serpent's coil, mm. but it's also the prophecy. Um, let me see if I can remember the prophecy. The... Until Shiloh comes, until Shiloh comes. It'll come to me, but it's not coming to me immediately. But there are prophecies. And you can go into these prophecies, and by using the Kabbalistic techniques of interpretation, you can discover that there are, again, numbers. In a future presentation, I will do a whole thing on Kabbalistic <coughs> numerology in the Bible. Is which is extremely one, interesting. Is that one where the child would, um, until he ate butter, butter and honey? He until, <coughs> Pardon me? He wouldn't eat butter and honey till shallow came? Is that the one you're... No, um, it's, um, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. That's what it says. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now the phrase, until Shiloh comes, I won't translate it into letters, but if you add it up, it's 358. So this was taken by Kabbalists as being a reference to the Meshiach or the anointed one. Now what was the anointed one? What was he anointed with? Oil. 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 Chris, Crisco means so, like Crisco oil. Like. Well, Christ and Chris, Christ, uh, Crisco cases were from Christ. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Crisco came from Christos, huh? Mm -hmm. See, the ancient knowledge is everywhere about us in everyday use. Wow. It's true. The symbol of wisdom. The symbol of what? Yeah. Wisdom. Wisdom, yes. And the caducius. Well, you have, yes, Here, here's this duality of the serpentine symbolism. On the one hand, the serpent can be evil, but on the other hand, a serpent of, wi uh, uh, a symbol of wisdom and healing. Be, be as wise as and this is why I think you have Meshiach and Netzach representing some kind of a fundamental cosmological duality. Just like knowledge can be used for good or evil. I mean, the same knowledge can be used to create. <clears throat> this is true. Be as wise as serpents. That's what Jesus said, didn't he? Be ye wise as serpents. Maybe he was saying, be ye wise of serpents. <clears throat> so here's the diving monkey figure. <clears throat> and here's the vase of the god K with flaming hair. I mean, to me, it doesn't get much more overt than that. The vase of the god K with flaming hair. He looks kind of upset, doesn't he? Uh -huh. And notice here, <clears throat> see there's that forehead tube. That's a characteristic signature of the god K. 
and here is a torch bearing dog or beast beneath a celestial, there's your celestial dragon strip from the Dresden Codex. Second representation of a dog now carrying the torches. Who was the celestial dog? Zeus. Another torch bearing god yeah. from the Dresden Codex. And where have we seen the torch bearing figure? The great angel from the book of Revelations with a face in one hand pouring out the waters of the great flood and the other hand the torch, the cosmic torch. So right there we have the two ways that the world is alternately destroyed through flood and fire. And you'll notice that the angel stands with one foot in the water and one foot on land. And you'll notice he's accompanied by the sign for Leo and the sign for Scorpio. <clears throat> and you'll notice that he has on his breast a seven-pointed star and a rainbow over his head. And you'll notice this strange looking little thing over here in the background. You'll also notice the sign for the sun on his head and the tetragrammaton written right there from right to left. Yod, He, Va, or Wow. Yod, He, Wow, He. Yehovah, which translates to the number 26. So, and then you've got these little yuds coming off of the flame. Now that is extremely significant because this is this right here is revealing one of the deepest of all occult doctrines right there. The same flame that is bringing destruction to the earth is also bringing seeds. the seeds. And what does yud mean? What? What does yud mean? Yud it means is the hand. seed. It means hand. It means hand, but it also is this, it's considered in Kabbalistic thought the seed letter of the whole alphabet. And every letter of the Hebrew alphabet is considered to be a permutation of that fundamental yud. The yud. It's in there. It's in every letter somehow. Yes, it's in every letter somehow. Thanks, Doris. That yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're going to get to the well of sacrifice, and this is really where we left off. We're talking about Chichen Itza here, an important and well-known holy center. There was once one of the great pilgrimage sites in the Yucatan. The etymology of Chichen Itza is mouth of the well of Itza, emphasizes its significance. In this flat, arid peninsula of 93,000 square miles, a series of natural wells or cenotes penetrate the limestone to a vast underground water-bearing stratum. Without this water, life would not be possible in the Yucatan. Chichen Itza has two large cenotes and several of its important monuments are situated between them. Now, in Chichen Itza, we have a perfect example of the cosmological city, where the entire city is laid out with geomantic and astronomic significance according to a pattern of sacred geometry and sacred geography. The same system that was used all over the ancient world with applications unique to each culture that was through which it was being expressed. See, the terrestrial plane of the Maya cosmogram was conceived as having reptilian form. Communication with underworld levels was believed to be possible through caves and cenotes. Many temple facades in Yucatan are composed of giant reptilian masks apparently representing Itzamna, the earth monster, or Wheat's, Wheat's monster. Caves and cenotes are known to have great significance in the sighting and orientation of many ancient Mesoamerican cities. The evolution from a sacred cave underworld entrance to a temple mountain underworld entrance has been suggested by several authors. Now what you have to realize is that the Mayanists, the Mayans were alchemists, just like all of the ancient master builders who built cities to link this world with the <coughs> other world or the celestial domain with the subterrestrial domain. And the idea was to raise up the powers of the earth and draw down the powers of the heavens and fuse them in the temple. And the action that would ignite that process and close the circuit was the conducting of the ritual within the sacred edifice, which was a machine 
that was designed and constructed for the purpose of transmuting these disparate forms of energy. So the Mayans built their sacred centers around these entrances into the underworld. And here is a photograph of the cenote of sacrifice at Chichen Itza. This is about the height of an eight-story building from the cliff rim down to the water surface level. This particular cenote has a bottom. Uh, a lot of the cenotes, like, uh, let's see, this one, for example, has no known bottom. When I visited this one, there were divers there who had been looking for the bottom. And so I got to talk to several of them and said, yeah, divers have been going in with, you know, some of the most, you know, double air tanks and sophisticated equipment and stuff, trying to find the bottom of this thing. And nobody had found the bottom yet. It apparently went into this whole vast maze or labyrinth of underground cave systems. And you see the entrances, the openings to these things will just be sheer, I mean, just you're walking along, and if you're not looking, you might step right into one of these things and... Never Is be there any uh, belief that they were empty of water at one time? Uh, no, not that I know of, no. Yeah, I was just thinking if they were possibly entrances or exits for the people of the underworld, after they, they hid from the catastrophe on the surface. but. Wanted you to disappear, well, you know. Yeah, this is the sacred cenote from the air. Let's see, do I have a ground plan? Here's a cenote from within. This one had a cave that you could actually, a, a tunnel that you could actually go through to get down to the bottom of the water level and actually swim in it. This was really nice, actually. Are there fish in there? Oh, yeah, this here is fresh water, yes. Yeah. What's that, Whit? Are there fish in that water? I think so, yeah. There, there are okay. fish in some of them. I'm sure there are. Okay. I don't remember what kind, though, but I do remember Around. there being funny, weird things nibbling. <laughs> on my, certain unidentified things chewing on my legs oh, you better. when I was in there. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're quite remarkable. I mean, they really are magical places. <clears throat> now, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, they started, like they went to Chichen Itza and they started uh, exit, dredging up some of the muck from the bottom of this, this well of sacrifice in order to see what, what the early Mayans had been throwing in there. And they did find human remains, skeletons and so forth, which suggests yeah, that one way or another, whether it was sacrifice or suicide or accident, people did fall into these things and drown. But they found a lot of very interesting artifacts, and here's one of them. And this is a scepter, notice what it is, a scepter with a diving figure. And by now, hopefully you recognize some of the characteristic features. This is the cape. Here's his arms, and he's holding those same two balls, just like on that vase. Here's his legs bent upwards, here. And the upper part of it, it's difficult to see here, but it was hollow, and it had this kind of lattice work, which may show up, let's see. Um, yeah, here's the description of it. Um, the diving figure scepter with a large bow at the forehead and a simple rounded collar descends, holding balls that may represent copal Smoke from burning copal probably poured from the chamber between its bent legs. Small perforations near the rim suggest that a lid may have directed the smoke out of the side slots and through the lattice at the back. So you see here's the lattice where the smoke would have poured out. Um, here's a closer up of it. You can see his scepter with a diving figure. Uh, dredged in 1904, has a perforated chamber with charring, and that's up here. You see, here's his legs coming up. He's got this symbol up here over his forehead. He's got hair that makes him almost look somewhat Egyptian. Now this thing was apparently used in rituals. A piece of copal was inserted up here and lit on fire, 
And as the smoke poured out, this thing was hurled down into the well of sacrifice. And it's jade on the face or lapis? What is I think it was jade, yes. Let's see, there we go. Turquoise. Uh, turquoise, that's what it was. Jade. Turquoise tesserae. So it was little turquoise tiles, real small ones. So he has long hair. There's the mosaic on the face, perforated chamber, stylized feathers. Here's the bent legs, and here's the balls representing the copal that he's carrying. So is the copal supposed to represent the comets and the mirror? The matter, perhaps? Yeah. Don. Copal is still used for in Native American uh, ceremonies like sweat lodges. For yes, 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 yes. As is tobacco is really worshipped. Mm -hmm. Of course, their tobacco is a lot different than when you go buy a pack of Marlboro. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> How so? Well, for one thing, it was a much had much higher nicotine content, and it didn't have a hundred different chemicals in it. Um, I also believe the tobacco that we use in our cigarettes was actually a species from South America mm -hmm. that ended up being imported up here to be. Uh -huh. Okay, and here is some commentary from one of the books on the Cenote of Sacrifice where they cataloged a lot of the treasures and artifacts taken out of the Cenote. That's what he says, Descent from the Heavens is one of the dominant symbolic themes at Chichen Itza throughout the post-classic period. Descending serpents grace the columns and balustrades of early post-classic structures and birds descend at the front of Toltec warrior headdresses. Anthropomorphic diving figures became important in late post-classic Maya religion, and the Bishop de Landa described the 16th century Maya feast of M. Ku, the descent of the god. In the late Mixtec and Maya manuscripts, descending figures often represent heavenly bodies, and here it is, folks, Copal burning ones might be Butts Eck, the smoking stars or comets. It's interesting how Copal is really revered, and then so are the comp the meteor, like at, at um, you know the, the Muslim, you know, when they yes. the circle. It's the same well, kind of what thing. I've been trying to demonstrate or make the argument is that these interactions between Earth and the cosmos in the form of meteor showers and fireballs and comets and so forth was an integral part of all of the world's ancient traditions. And so integral that it provides really one of the keys for deciphering everything else. Diving figures are also found on the facades of the middle post-classic temples at Tulum on the east coast and this scepter may be contemporary with an early Tulum wall painting. Now notice the scepter. This is what many of these diving figures are holding, just like in the the uh, the uh, biblical verse that I quoted. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Uh, throughout the approximately seven centuries, from A.D. 800 to 1500, of its ceremonial use. Objects offered to the waters of the cenote, 20 meters below, descended from above like the copal offered by this figure. Like the fallen copal, which was offered in flames, perhaps the sacrificial objects emulated the setting of brilliant heavenly bodies. Now here, this Mayanist commentator is getting this close to getting it, but then he doesn't put, make the final connection. And here's another object. Again, it has the hollow chamber at the top for the burning smoke to pour out of. It's a diving figure on it. So here again, you can see in their ritual use, they've got these scepters with diving figures, smoke pouring out of them. They throw them into these unique geological formations, these sinkholes, some of which have no bottoms, which traditionally the Mayans associated with being entrances into the underworld or the other world. Do you think some of those sinkholes could have been created by a meteor? We're going to get to that. It's coming up very soon. 